Good afternoon. The first item of business this afternoon is portfolio questions. And the first portfolio is Rural Affairs, Land Reform and Islands. And at question number one, I call Liam Kerr. To ask the Scottish Government what the return has been on any anticipated community, biodiversity and environmental outcomes resulting from the £17.6 million public purchase of Glen Prosen by Forestry and Land Scotland. Cabinet Secretary Mary Gujon. The acquisition at Glen Prosen links neighbouring parcels of public land and it provides opportunities for landscape scale restoration. And Forestry and Land Scotland are currently working on creating new woodland, montane scrub, restoring peatlands and rivers, improving biodiversity as well as ensuring that there's resilience to climate change. And preparatory work over the last 20 months has included ecological surveys to better understand the landscape and guide interventions, extensive public community and stakeholder consultation, clearing wind blow, as well as beginning deer management and fencing. And the land management plan is expected to come forward next year. Forestry and Land Scotland is pursuing some really promising opportunities to create new jobs and economic benefits, which include proposals for a tree nursery, an education offer, a manufacturing business, a recreation proposition, a field study centre and residential use. Linker. Well, that's certainly one way to look at it. Local reports say that FLS, since FLS outbid private bidders a couple of years ago, the top of the Glen has become effectively depopulated. Yeah. Families have been turfed out of their homes, and which lie abandoned and decaying, and risk the local school's closure. And Angus already has a real problem with rural depopulation and mothballed schools. Meanwhile, the deer population is virtually extinct on Heather Moorland, which is unmanaged. So what precisely, Cabinet Secretary, is the Scottish Government doing to turn this situation around? And does the Minister agree that this experiment should never be repeated in Angus? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, first of all, uh, I think we need to set some facts straight about some of the claims that have just been made by Liam Kerr, which are com completely baseless. I think, first of all, in relation to the housing and the accusation that he made about the houses being in disrepair. Now, the houses, as well as the other built assets that exist in Glen Prosen, are in a good condition, and they are actively being maintained, and they are currently provide homes for two families at the moment. Now, there has been an expressions of interest exercise which engaged the market on ideas for the future future development of the wider portfolio of built assets and discussion is now underway with interested parties about the possibility of a range of future uses that would lead to community benefits as well and local communities have also been fully engaged in the process of the land management plan. There is also an accusation that he would levelled there about the employees of the state and I think it is really uh, important to set the record straight here. Now the seller who previously had Glen Prosen ran it as a sporting estate but wound down their business and that included making the workforce redundant. Now, termination of the previous employment was undertaken by the seller with no involvement of FLS and the full-time employees had service, uh, service occupancy agreements for their homes. Now, there were five full-time and one part-time employees at Glen Prosen prior to the sale and FLS engaged with them as soon as they were able to do that. Two of the former estate employees moved on before the acquisition completed and the part-time role ended when the business activities of the estate were wound up. And upon FLS, acquiring the estate. Three former estate employees were given tenancies. One has since moved on. Another has a part-time contract with FLS on the estate. And the last is employed elsewhere, but continues as a tenant. So I hope that clarifies uh, the situation I think, for Mr. Thank Kerr. you, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you. Uh, we've got two supplementaries. Uh, supplementary, Colin Beasy. Can the Cabinet Secretary please set out the strategic value of acquiring Glen Prosen with regards to these outcomes? And will any specific proposals for the management of this land be subject to a form of consultation? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Colin Beattie for raising that important question there and allow me the opportunity to set that out because the Angus Glens project, which of course includes Glen Prosen, involves a strategic cluster of land in the Cairngorms National Park which offers scope to deliver on the Scottish Government's commitment to <coughs> nature recovery, to climate resilience, as well as benefiting people through the economic, educational, social and wellbeing opportunities that are being looked at at the moment. Now, this is a really large project. It is going to take time to deliver 
deliver, but it is of crucial importance to tackling the climate and biodiversity cl and climate crisis that we face. But I really do also want to assure Colin Beattie, as well as other members in the Chamber today, that FLS has been actively engaging and consulting with all local stakeholders, and that, especially the local community and neighbouring landowners and land managers, on the terms of their draft land management plan. And that's going to continue during the process of the finalisation of that plan for the area, ensuring that the potential opportunities afforded by that acquisition are understood and provided for. Thank you. And uh, supplementary, Edward Benton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And let's get the facts and figures correct. Uh, expenditure at Glen Prosen has outstripped income by 25%. 18 members of FLS Scotland seem to be floating around consulting about various things. And we still don't have a management plan two and a half years after it was purchased. Promise for this autumn? Is it going to be delivered, Cabinet Secretary? Or is it still as far away as it seemed in August of this year? I don't know if the member had actually listened to my previous responses where I outlined that and said that the land when the land management plan would be coming forward. And as I've already outlined in previous responses too, there's no getting around the fact that this is a very large project. We also want to make sure, and FLS want to ensure, that that engagement takes place to ensure the land management plan that comes forward is done in consultation with the local communities too. So of course that takes time, as do all the various other assessments that have to be undertaken as part of that process. But I've said it will come forward next year, there will be engagement as part of that too. Uh, question number two, Claire Hockey. To ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to support animal welfare. Minister Jim Fairley. Uh, thank you, President Officer. The Scottish Government is fully committed to improving and protecting the welfare of animals in Scotland. We have delivered our on course to deliver several of our programme for government and commitments, including consulting on extending licensing legislation to animal care services consulting and phasing out cages for laying hens and banning the export of livestock for fattening or slaughter. So we are committed to working with our UK counterparts to deliver welfare improvements whenever it is appropriate to do so. However, we will not hesitate to act independently if it is needed in order to improve animal welfare. Okay. The Minister will be aware of my long-standing concerns about the safety and treatment of greyhounds used in racing. Shawfield Stadium in my constituency was the last licensed track in Scotland, but thankfully no races have taken place since the pandemic. In my view, and that of the Scottish Animal Welfare Commission, as well as numerous other animal welfare organisations, greyhound racing is inherently unsafe, and so I believe a phase-out ban is required sooner rather than later. Can the Minister provide an update on any representations he's had with stakeholders regarding greyhound racing over recent months? Minister. Uh, there have been no meetings to discuss greyhound racing uh, in the recent months, but I understand that the Rural Affairs Committee will, will report on petition PE1758, which calls for an end to greyhound racing in Scotland. And of course, Mr Ruskell's bill is being brought forward, so I'll be considering both of these carefully before deciding how to proceed. Supplementary, Tim Eagle. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I refer members to my register of interest as a farmer. One of the increasing threats to livestock welfare is attacks from dogs. Despite increasing, uh, introducing sorry, harsher penalties in November 2021, livestock worrying continues to be an issue across rural Scotland. What more can this government do uh, to address this issue? And will there be a commitment to reviewing the Scottish Outdoor Access Code as Scotland's rural college is recommended? Minister. Uh, the, the access code, uh, I, I know that this issue has been raised before, but uh, in terms of getting the balance between allowing people to have that right of responsible access is, is something that we, we will have to consider. In terms of the, um, uh, the livestock worrying, which Mr Eagle rightly points out is a disaster for livestock farmers in Scotland, um, the, the fact that the Scottish Government has supported Emma Harper's uh, 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 wildlife, uh, livestock worrying bill has been a crucial step forward. We now have a, a maximum penalty of up to £40,000 fine uh, or, and, or, or jail. Um, so we are taking this very seriously. Uh, myself, other ministers and other members of the, part, uh, of the government continue to put the message out. Please keep your dogs under control, particularly when you're amongst livestock, because they have no place to be in there. And so I'll mention Matt Ruskell. The greyhound racing industry's governing body recorded that over 100 dogs died and over 4,000 were injured while racing at regulated tracks in England and Wales last year. So does the minister recognise that the nature of this activity, with dogs running against each other at speeds of up to 40 mile an hour around sharp bends, leads to a similar rate of collision at any track, regardless of whether that's in Newcastle or in Fife? Minister. 
Uh, I recognise that the member has had a long-standing concern around greyhound racing, and as I've said, we will wait to see what the, uh, the result of the petition is and of the, the member's bill, and we will take our decisions from there. Question number three, Bob Doris. To ask the Scottish Government what interaction and correspondence it has had regarding matters related to Scotland's rural economy with the UK Secretary of State for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, including relevant officials, since their appointment in July. I have met once so far with Steve Reid, the new UK Secretary of State for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, where we discussed a range of issues of mutual interest, and my officials also regularly meet with his officials too. Firstly, I just want to set out that I do welcome the resetting of the relationship between Scottish and UK government ministers since the general election and the re, uh, what has been the reinstigation of the interministerial group on environment, food and rural affairs, which will actually be meeting for the first time in a year on the 16th of September. So I look forward to continuing to build a more open and hopefully constructive relationship in the coming months. Bob Torres. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Uh, even the City Boy knows agriculture is a long-term endeavour with plans sometimes made years in advance. So far, the UK Government has not really said very much in relation to future funding, leading to concerns that there is not enough clarity and certainty. It may be just as bad as the previous UK Government. Will the Cabinet Secretary commit today to writing to the UK Government well ahead of the UK budget to reiterate the calls of both industry and the SNP that Scotland's agriculture sector needs clarity and certainty over future funding settlements? Cabinet Secretary. This is, of course, a hugely important matter that Bob Doris is raising today because, uh, as you will no doubt be aware, there is no U UK Government agricultural funding commitment beyond next year. And that is why the UK Government has to commit to urgent, meaningful engagement on future multi-year programme funding settlement to really provide that certainty and assurance that is needed for us to be able to deliver future agricultural policies. Because what we do know is that this uncertainty that has been created by that lack of clarity is having a real direct impact now, and it is a real missed opportunity to deliver public good and to take urgent measures to meet the current and future climate, emissions, uh, climate change emissions reduction targets for Scotland, as well as for the wider UK. And I do intend to raise this issue with the DEFRA Secretary of State when we meet at the IMG meeting on Monday. Question number four, Graeme Simpson. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government for what reason rainforests were excluded from the Deer Management Incentive Scheme pilots. Minister Jim Fairley. Uh, thank you, President Officer. The purpose of these pilots is to explore incentives for, tier, for deer management in different local circumstances. And the pilots were designed around a number of criteria, including access to data on current cull levels and the potential barriers to increasing deer management. The pilots were being run in Cairngorms National Park, focusing on red deer. They are in the central belt with a focus on roe and in South Loch Ness with a focus on Sika. We also do also provide support for projects that help restore and expand Scotland's rainforests, with funding available to reduce deer impacts alongside other activities, including rhododendron control. Uh, thank you. Um, can I thank the Minister for that answer? Um, he will know that deer are a natural part of the uh, rainforest ecosystem. But increasing numbers of deer and their mobility mean that they're also one of the main barriers to uh, the rainforest restoration. So, given that the Scottish Government has committed to restoring Scotland's rainforests, can I ask the Minister to uh, reconsider his current position and ensure that the deer management incentive scheme will be extended to key rainforest locations? Minister. Well, we won't ex expand the current pilot scheme, but this is part of a package of looking at how we're going to manage deer across the whole country, um, and rainforests are very crucial to that, to what we, we look at as we go forward. Um, but this is a, a different, specific pilot for a specific set of circumstances, um, but you can be assured that rainforests are very much part of our thinking longer term. And sort of mention, Kenneth Gibson. Does the Minister agree that deer management plans should consider biodiversity? And can he advise what progress is being made towards reintroducing Scotland's native Eurasian lynx to help control deer populations naturally, as has successfully happened over the last 50 years in Austria, Croatia, Czechia, France, Germany, Italy, Poland, Slovenia and Switzerland, without any adverse impact on people, pets or livestock? Minister. There are no intentions to allow the introduction of lynx in Scotland. Question number five, Finlay Carson. 
Question five from the Carson. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what steps is taken to ensure that any future national, Galloway National Park will work in the best interests of local communities. Cabinet Secretary. If there is to be a new national park in Galloway, it must be focused on helping to meet the needs of local communities. Nature Scott has begun its investigation into the proposal, and this will involve extensive public consultation. We want local people, communities and businesses to have their say on whether Galloway should become Scotland's next national park, as well as what role a new park could play in supporting economic growth, community development, visitor management and environmental protection. And when we receive Nature Scott's report next spring, we will carefully consider its findings before setting out or deciding on any next steps. Finley Carson. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for her response. As it's taken the Government two years to get the nomination for a national park on the table and almost ten years for the Galloway National Park Association to make their case, do you feel that it's sufficient time uh, has been given to Nature Scott to prepare a consultation document and then we'll only give them 12 weeks to consult on it, not to mention the 12 weeks will also take in Christmas and New Year? I am aware that the Scottish Government then decides to designate there will be further consultation, but only on the finer detail. Cabinet Secretary, given that the National Park designation will have significant impacts which will last generations, does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that the people of Galloway should be given a significantly longer opportunity to make their feelings known, even if this pushes the decision to designate or not and any subsequent legislation into the next parliamentary term? Cabinet Secretary. I understand the concern that has been raised uh, by Finlay Carson in relation, <coughs> to, uh, in relation to this issue, which is why I have set out why the, uh, this period of investigation and reporting that has been undertaken by Nature Scott is hugely important and why I, I really would encourage everybody uh, living in the proposed area ensures that they have their say. Now, in setting out that time frame, I do believe it is enough time, while, um, and it's, as I would set out in a response to committee this morning, while there is a formal consultation time within that, Nature Scott have published an online resource as of yesterday where they're setting out where all that information will be available, how people will be able to have their say. And out with that consultation, I know there will be a number of engagement and other uh, events that, uh, that communities can attend and ensure they have their, their voice known and heard. But what I would say is that I'm not going to commit at this stage to potentially extending a process when I don't know if, if that's what's needed. I'm happy to consider this as we move through the investigation if it appears more time may be needed. But again, I, th I think it can be delivered within the time frame, which is why it's been set out as it is. But again, I would encourage everyone to take part. Supplementary, Emma Harper. Thank you, President Officer. Just to reiterate, Cabinet Secretary, the Galloway National Park proposal has caused controversy locally, with my office receiving over 200 representatives of people's views. It is so important that communities, both small and large, are consulted so that their voices are heard and that any decision which is taken works in the best interests of the Galloway's diverse communities. So can the Cabinet Secretary just pr provide further assurance that Nature Scott will come to all communities in the region and speak to everyone who would like to be heard. I want to thank Emma Harper for her question and I would just want to say from the outset that I fully agree that every community in Dumfries and Galloway should be able to have their say on the proposal as to whether or not to establish a national park. As I just outlined in my previous response yesterday, Nature Scott launched a dedicated information website and online engagement hub for local residents and communities to find out more information. And I know that later this month, Nature Scott are planning further engagement. Will they be issuing a leaflet to all households within and close to the proposed area, explaining what the consultation process is going to involve, as well as explaining how people can take part. And information will be available on Nature Scott's website. Uh, everyone with an interest will be able to make their views known through the consultation paper. There will be surveys. There's going to be a series of public meetings, events and drop-in surgeries. There will also be engagement and events with local businesses and organisations, community councils, young people and equality groups. So I hope that provides the assurance that Emma Harper and I know other members representing the south of Scotland are looking for. A supplementary, Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that in many ways we actually have a blank sheet of paper here? There's no single model of a national park, that local people should take part in the consultation, not just to give their view on whether they support it, but to shape the powers, the boundary, the vision of any proposed Galloway National Park. And if the government do decide to go ahead with the proposal, will she give an assurance that any national park will be made in Galloway for the people of Galloway? 
Cabinet Secretary. I, I, yes, I, I could absolutely give that assurance. And I really want to thank Colin Smith for raising what is a hugely important point, because the current national parks that we have are very different to each other. And again, with this proposal, it is really starting with a blank sheet of paper, you know, in terms of the overall uh, powers that the park could have, uh, whether that's in relation to planning. There's obviously issues that could be discussed around the boundary and what that looks like. Galloway is obviously a very different nature to the other uh, national park areas that we have, where agriculture is so vitally important and uh, is uh, of the, the area as a whole. So it's vital that all of that is recognised. So again, that's where I would absolutely encourage uh, everyone living in Galloway in the proposed area to have their say through the <coughs> events and that all of that information will be published and circulated to them. Question number six, Jimmy Halker johnson To ask the Scottish Government what impact its recently announced budget reductions will have on investment in infrastructure that supports agriculture in remote and island communities. Minister. Uh, thank you, President Officer. The Rowry portfolio, portfolio has supported the response to the financial pressures by identifying small reductions, but none of these relate to investment in infrastructure that supports agriculture in rural and island communities. We continue to invest in agricultural communities, and last week we announced that the support payments of over £243 million will start to be paid to uh, over 11,500 farming businesses. We are also driving an ambitious programme of vessel and infrastructure upgrades and replacements in the coming years, including port projects nearing completion, six major vessels currently under construction, and the seven small vessels CMAL are progressing through procurement. Uh, Jimmy Hawkins Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I remind members of my register of interest as a partner in a farming business? And on Back British Farming Day, can I thank farmers across the country, and particularly from my region of the Highlands and Islands, for all they do? It's now over six years since Orkney's abattoir closed, and despite the efforts of local stakeholders and warm words from the Scottish Government, no solution has yet been found for a new facility. Local abattoirs play an important role in supporting local rural businesses, in agriculture, in animal welfare, and in reducing food miles. And so, on back British Farming Day, can the, cabinet, sorry, can the Minister advise me if the Scottish Government is playing any role con uh, currently in supporting the establishment of a new abattoir in Orkney? Minister. Uh, there, there are lo <laughs> the, small abattoir, uh, the loss of small abattoirs across the country has been a huge issue, and I fully accept that it has been something that I've, I've concerned about myself long before I came into this place. Um, the, I'm prepared to meet up with the, with, the, with the member specifically on the Orkney issue, uh, but we have got funding that has gone in from the Small Producers Pilot Fund, but I don't want to be specific in talking about where that would go. Um, but I absolutely take on board that we have an issue in terms of small abattoirs. Supplementary, Rosie Grant. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. The Minister will be aware that auction marts are beginning to leave islands, forcing island farmers and crofters to take their livestock off island to sell. That means that they accept lower prices because otherwise they have to take those animals back onto island. And I wonder what he can do to help islands continue to have their auction marts locally so that they can sell their animals at the highest price. Yeah, unfortunately, ag uh, agricultural markets are uh, private businesses and they will take commercial decisions based on that. However, the, the, ru the rural economy is absolutely founded on livestock markets and the, the auction houses that I've dealt with, they know that they have a responsibility to be able to make sure that these island communities can continue to trade. So if there is a specific issue in a specific area, I'm quite happy to have that conversation with you and with the auction market and, and uh, question that you're talking about. And supplementary, Liam MacArthur. Uh, thank you. It's been suggested uh, local abattoirs are absolutely in an integral part of the infrastructure supporting our farming community. Uh, Orkney has felt keenly the loss of the abattoir uh, in the islands, but there are plans um, to develop a more bespoke uh, abattoir. Um, there has been uh, assessments made of uh, the viability of that, uh, and I would just echo the, the, the plea that the Minister has already received, that he engages with that and ensures that Scottish Government give um, whatever support they can to the delivery of uh, an abattoir that uh, is much needed in the islands I represent. Minister. Yeah, I can give that absolute assurance that I am more than happy to meet the member, and I am absolutely prepared to engage with whatever it is that we can do to support any small abattoir. Question number seven, Pam Duncan Glancy. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions the Rural Affairs Secretary has had with ministerial colleagues regarding how its procurement powers can encourage the availability of healthy local food. Cabinet Secretary. 
The Scottish Government recognises that public procurement plays a key role in ensuring that everyone has access to healthy, fresh and seasonal food. This understanding is reflected in our draft Good Food Nation Plan, which outlines how we seek to maximise the impact that procurement can have through the application of relevant legislation and policy. Our cross-cutting approach is also supported by the Ministerial Working Group on Food, which enables ministers to work collectively to drive that cross-portfolio engagement on food-related issues and ensure that food policy is coordinated and cohesive. Pam Duncan Glancy. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Many third sector organisations like Grow73 in my region do great work and support local healthy food provision, and they often rely on commissioned grants from government or local government. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary for her assurance that her government are using all the powers in its control to support the procurement of good local food and give a guarantee that third sector organisations providing access to it will get funding decisions in a prompt and efficient way? Uh, the member does raise a really important point there, and that is why it is one that we recognised in our draft Good Food Nation plan. What we try to set out in the plan, though, is that uh, there are a number of mechanisms that I could set out and follow up with the, the member on to, as to how we can encourage that local procurement and do that within the existing powers that we have. But the difficulties with uh, procurement are there is cross-cutting pieces of leg legislation that we have to adhere to. But again, we know there are places that make that work, and we can make that work within the current framework that we have. We'd also undertaken a consultation on the draft Good Food Nation plan earlier this year. We received a significant response to that, which I'm really encouraged by, where we can hopefully look to strengthen some of the provisions that we have in that. And that's where I look forward to really having that discussion to see what more, and if, it's in, if there are specific organisations a member would like me to engage with, I'm more than happy to do so to see how we can really strengthen that. Supplementary, Rachel Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. 85% of the British public support increasing our self-sufficiency in UK food production. Today is back. British Farming Day and the NFU Scotland are at Westminster supporting MPs to mark this important day. Will the Cabinet Secretary support Scottish Conservative calls to hold a back British Farming Day here in the Scottish Parliament so we can celebrate the importance of Scottish farming? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I would hope in the job that we do uh, every day that we are supporting our farmers. I think it's hugely important, and especially I know the work that are being undertaken by the NFU, as you've said, uh, and the, the sterling work that they do in raising the profile of our industry and its importance. But I've also been really heartened, I think, by some of the questions that I've received across the chamber today uh, from other members who recognise that the funding that we put into agriculture is so hugely important because of food production. It's such an essential basic need that we, uh, we need to survive, which is why I'm proud to support our farmers. And of course, I'm more than happy to enter into uh, discussions uh, with Rachel Hamilton if she has specific celebrations that she'd like to have in mind. But as ever, I, you know, I'm privileged in this job that I get to travel across the country to meet our different farmers and crofters, those involved in producing our food, and of course, happy to celebrate their achievements. Uh, then we will move now to question number eight, uh, as time is marching on. Uh, Martin Fraser. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what support it is providing for new entrants to farming. Minister. Uh, the Scottish Government continues to invest in new entrants into farming and crofting. From 2015 to September 2024, there has been the region of £9.5 million of young farmer and new entrant support that has been paid under the National Reserve. The Scottish Government has helped to identify 134 land opportunities through the Farming Opportunities for New Entrants Group, facilitated over 250 joint ventures through the Scottish Land Matching Service, offered a range of consultancy advice to new entrants for, through the Farm Advisory Service, and supported the Machinery Ring Pre-Apprenticeship Programme and the Next Generation Practical Training Fund to create opportunities for new entrants and young people. Murder Fraser. Um, can I thank the Minister for his response? I know he will be aware of the issue impacting on one of my five constituents, who as a new entrant was given a 10-year starter farm tenancy from Forestry Land Scotland, built up a business, but at the end of the 10-year period found it impossible to find alternative land to farm, and now faces having to leave the industry altogether, which is a dismal outcome for everybody involved. So what can the Minister do to help my constituent and any others who are caught in a similar situation? Minister. Uh, I am aware of the individual case that the member has raised. It is not a discussion I would like to have in the chamber. I am more than happy to meet with the member after this, um, after this, uh, this session. Uh, but what I can say is that the, the, the new entrance scheme was paused because it was not having the effect, but there were some successes that have come out of that. 
We've also just released in the programme for government that we are looking at are asking our, our public authorities to look at what land they have got in order to create more opportunities for new farmers uh, or new entrants to farming. Um, as someone who had a, a, an awful job trying to get into farming myself, this is something I'm absolutely committed to and will ensure that we can do everything that we can to make sure the Scottish Government is doing what we can to get young people into farming. Thank you, Minister. That concludes portfolio questions on rural affairs, land reform and islands. So there will be a very short pause before we move on to the next portfolio to allow front bench teams to change position as quickly as possible. Please, thank you. Thank you. The next portfolio is NHS recovery, health and social care. Uh, question number one has been withdrawn. I call question number two, Sue Weber. To ask the Scottish Government for its response to Stephen Smith's evaluation of alcohol-related brain damage, ARBD, residential rehabilitation service in Edinburgh. Minister Jenny Minto. The Scottish Government is currently reviewing the evaluation of the Penumbra Milestone Alcohol-Related Brain Damage ARBD unit undertaken by Dr Smith. The report highlights the improvement in cognitive function for people assessed in the evaluation period, as well as reduced rates in attendance at emergency departments. The Scottish Government will review the findings and recommendations raised in the report and will consider these in future policy development. Sue Weber. Uh, thank you. I thank the Minister for that response. Uh, this week we learned that 1,277 people tragically lost their lives to alcohol in 2023, a 15-year high that is, quite frankly, nothing to celebrate. Uh, 1,277 people who have lived their lives, who have lived years of poor health and who have left behind families and friends. The effects are felt by so, so many. 40% fewer people are accessing alcohol services than a decade ago. And when people do access these services, they are much older and have increasingly complex problems as a result. The ARBD run by Penumbra at Milestone House saves lives, yet it is facing the withdrawal of funding. Minister, given that the service reduces NHS Lothian and hospital bed days by nearly 2,000 a year, what impact assessment has been carried out if this service was to close? Minister. I thank Sue Weber for her question and would like to put on record um, my sympathy and condolences to all the families who have been impacted in the last year uh, due to drug, uh, sorry, alcohol deaths of their loved ones. As Sue Weber will know, decisions on funding and service provision are made at a local level by NHS Lothian. And while we have no official contact with the Health Board on this, Ministers would have to consider the implications of such a move very carefully. We have set out, the Scottish Government has set out a clear definition of what counts as residential rehabilitation and used it consistently. We are working with members of our expert residential rehabilitation development working group to assess whether the ARBD unit meets the definition and will provide an update to the service manager in due course. Supplementary, Colin Beasy. Following a Public Health Scotland report from February this year showing that the Scottish Government is on track to hit its target of 1,000 individuals per year publicly funded to go to rehab by 2026, can the Minister outline key steps which are being taken to ensure this target is met? Thank Colin Minister. Beattie for his question. The Scottish Government has taken a number of actions to increase access to residential rehab and meet our targets. This includes providing alcohol and drug partnerships with £5 million per year for residential rehab, creating a £2 million residential rehab additional placement fund to fund additional placements in local areas and have increased demand for placements that have to increase demand for placements, expanding residential rehab capacity by making £38 million available to eight projects across Scotland to provide 140 more beds by 2025-26. A supplementary, Carol Mocking. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, given the recent news that alcohol-related deaths are at a 15-year high and the number of people accessing planned alcohol care and treatment has been declining for a decade, healthcare professionals in my own region of South Scotland tell me that the prevalence of ARBD unplanned presentations at emergency departments is increasing. This is not good for the 
uh, patients, the families or the staff. Does the government actually recognise this? And what measures are they taking to ensure early intervention and support to these patients and families can actually be achieved right across Scotland? Uh, Minister. I thank Carol Mockham for her question. And yes, the Scottish Government does absolutely recognise that. And we've asked Public Health Scotland to investigate the recent fall in numbers of referrals to alcohol and drug specialist services. What we are doing is we're giving funding to alcohol and drug partnerships, which is for both alcohol and drug treatment services. And these ser because these services are integrated, £112 million um, has been made available to them, and this funding is used to ensure that they can make the right local decisions. But I do absolutely recognise um, that there's been a fall in numbers, and we need to, we need to look at the, the reasons behind that, whether it's stigma, whether it's not lack of understanding as to where these services are. Question number three, Fulton McGregor. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what recent discussions it has had with NHS Lanarkshire regarding the progress of the Monklands replacement project. Minister Marie Todd. The business case remains under development and NHS Lanarkshire has been invited to provide an update to the Scottish Government's Capital Investment Group later this month. Uh, Fulton McGregor. I thank the Minister for that response. Clearly the financial circumstances are extremely difficult just now with an austerity agenda being pursued by the UK Government. However, that said, I have had contact from many constituents worried that there may be further delays to the new hospital, which is badly needed. I know that the Cabinet Secretary Neil Gray will have had similar rep representations in his role as constituency MSP, and I appreciate this is why he cannot answer today's question. Can I therefore ask to reassure my constituents if, if the Minister can confirm that the Monklands replacement project remains a top priority for the Scottish Government? Retard, Minister. Yes. I absolutely understand the concerns of the members' constituents, and as we've made clear, the capital funding position is extremely challenging, and all capital projects are under review to ensure that they're affordable and deliverable. The Scottish Government is in ongoing discussions with NHS Lanarkshire on the impact of budget settlement on the proposal to replace Monklands Hospital, and further clarity on the health capital programme, including Monklands, will be provided following the 25-26 Scottish Budget and the review of uh, infrastructure investment plan. Question number four, Hamza Yusuf. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on funding allocations to ensure the best possible cancer care, cancer care for patients, particularly in their local communities. Minister Jenny Minter. The Scottish Government has disbursed cancer service allocations for this year to local health boards, including £4.6 million for systemic anti-cancer therapy and £11.3 million for cancer waiting times in line with our overall strategic aim that, where possible, diagnostic tests and treatment are situated as close to home and travel to specialist care is fully supported. In addition, we are working in partnership with Macmillan to improve the service we offer to offer patients in local communities through the Transforming Cancer Care programme. This is the first of its kind in the UK and ensures that every patient with cancer in Scotland has access to a specialist key support worker who can assist in accessing wider local services. Hamza Yusuf. Can I thank the Minister for that uh, comprehensive uh, response? And I'm sure that the Minister, like me, was really pleased to see the results of the Scottish Cancer Patient Experience Survey published yesterday, showing that 95% of cancer patients viewed the care that they received positively. But one area of improvement, which I know the Minister will share with me is that uh, cancer patients often tell us that they want that single point of contact through their cancer journey for advice and for support. So can the Minister outline the support and the funding the Scottish Government is providing to embed single points of contact right across uh, Scotland's NHS, but in particular uh, the Greater Glasgow and Clyde NHS uh, board area, which affects my constituents in Glasgow Public? Minister. I thank um, Sir Yusuf for, for his question and also um, reiterate um, the, the notes, the points he makes about the positive survey from Macmillan. And yes, I absolutely agree with the importance and effectiveness of a single point of contact to provide advice and support during a person's cancer journey. We have continued investment in 2024-25 in our single point of contact programme, including, for example, in NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde, where we have invested over £250,000 to support people with gynaecological, prostate and lung cancer. 
We are working with Healthcare Improvement Scotland to review the programme to consider how we best scale up the approach across Scotland. A supplementary, Jackie Bailey. Yesterday, the Scottish Cancer Patient Experience Survey 2024 found that more than one in five cancer patients felt that they should have been seen much sooner for diagnosis. Early intervention and treatment, I think we would all acknowledge, is key to beating cancer, but the Scottish Government's continued failure to meet waiting time targets is putting lives at risk. So can the Minister tell me what outcomes will be achieved by the additional, I think, £11 million she mentioned, and by when will this improve the missed 31 and 62 day cancer waiting time targets? Minister. Jackie Bailey is right. Um, the, the, we, we have got room for improvement with regard to uh, waiting times for cancer. And the work that we are doing, um, £1.2 million of the funding has been directed directly towards diagnostics and we continue to focus on improving timely access to cancer services, which is why our programme for government has committed to opening a, a further rapid cancer diagnostic service, bringing our national total to six. Question number five, Audrey Nicholl. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government, in light of the recent outbreak of MPOX in Africa, which was declared by the World Health Organisation on the 14th of August to be a public health emergency of international concern, what plans it has put in place for any potential outbreak of MPOX in Scotland? Cabinet Secretary Neil Gray. Thank you, President Officer. We are aware of the recent outbreak of MPOX in Africa, which has been declared as a public health emergency of international concern by the World Health Organisation. Currently, there are no cases of clade 1 MPOX confirmed in the UK, and the risk to the UK population is considered low. The Scottish Government and Public Health Scotland are working closely with public health colleagues across the UK, including uh, other UK ministerial colleagues, as well as NHS boards uh, in Scotland, to monitor the situation uh, and prepare for any cases that we might see. Uh, question number six. Oh, I'm terribly sorry. It's not. It's Audrey Nicholl. <laughs> Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that helpful response. I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary can provide an update on how the general population is being informed about this disease uh, and assure the public that transmission rates, as he said, are a low risk to the general population. And now to the Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I thank uh, Audrey Nicholl for raising uh, this important issue. Uh, colleagues will have received uh, a, a letter that uh, I sent to all MSPs on the 28th of August. I have offered a, a meeting and a briefing for all opposition colleagues next week uh, to discuss uh, this very issue, to make sure that, from a public information perspective, we as, as local leaders are able uh, to provide reassurance that Public Health Scotland continues to work closely closely uh, with UK health security agency uh, colleagues to update a range of guidance for health professionals and the general public on MPOX, both for the existing outbreak of clade 2B MPOX, which has been present since uh, 2022 uh, in the UK, and to investigate and plan for the new strain clade 1B, uh, which has been spreading in parts of Africa. This includes updates to the Public Health Scotland website and NHS Inform, which provides information to the general public on MPOX, including how it is transmitted, symptoms, uh, who to contact, treatment and the do's and don'ts and updates for the Fit to Travel website for travellers uh, to Central Africa. The overall risk, presiding officer, to the public is considered low, uh, and there ha has to date been no cases of this clade in Scotland. Uh, we are reminding people who have travelled recently to the affected areas to be aware of the signs and symptoms and to contact a health professional if they are concerned. And now question number six, Richard Leonard. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to support specialist neonatal intensive care units across Scotland. Minister Jenny Minto. The Scottish Government commissioned independent modelling of neonatal in intensive care in Scotland and the report was published on the 29th of May. We have asked the regional chief executives to progress with development of implementation plans with the expectation that implementation of the new model is phased over the next one to two years. Additionally, the Scottish Government, with the support of Health Improvement Scotland and Bliss, has consulted families on implementation of the new model. We are sharing the outputs of that consultation with regional chief executives to inform development of pathways and processes for the new model of care. Jointly with national clinical leads, we are considering Scotland-level actions required. The Scottish Government continues to provide funding to the boards 
hosting the neonatal intensive care units to build the capacity required. Richard Leonard. Uh, can I thank the Minister for her reply? Uh, but let's get the facts straight here. The proposal to downgrade the neonatal unit at Wishaw Hospital is based on inconsistent, old and inaccurate data, a flawed methodology and excluded any consultation with parents and families. This morning, the Citizen Participation and Public Petitions Committee considered a petition from those same parents and families. As a result, the committee has agreed to go on a site visit. Why hasn't Scotland's Minister for Public Health and Women's Health ever done the same? Will she now visit the Wish Your Specialist Neonatal Intensive Care Unit and speak to staff and listen to their concerns? And will she review again her decision to downgrade the unit in Wishaw in light of deliverability, capacity and resilience issues which risk not only the human rights thank but you. the human lives Min of those affected? Minister. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I'm sure that Richard Leonard would like to correct the parliamentary record because I have visited Wishaw Neonatal. I have also visited Nine Wells. I have also visited the QEUH. And I have been gathering evidence from people across the health board, across the neonatal and maternity services that Scotland provides. I am completely focused on, the, on ensuring that we make the right decision for the smallest or the sickest babies in Scotland. And the expert advice that we have received, that I have read numerous occasions and spoken to the people involved, shows that reducing to three intensive care neonatal units is the correct uh, decision to support families with the smallest and sickest babies. And supplementary, Clay Hockey. Thank you, President Officer. Can the Minister speak to the success of the implementation of the Best Start Five Year Forward Plan for maternity and neonatal care and advise how the Scottish Government will continue to ensure women and babies receive the highest quality of care according to their needs? Minister. Thank Claire Hockey for her question. The best start set out our vision of a transformation of maternity and neonatal services, and the vast majority of recommendations have been implemented. Health boards have embedded the best start in local maternity and neonatal care, supported by national initiatives such as the Young Patients Family Fund, improvements to adverse events investigating, and the National Bereavement Care Pathway. Work continues to establish the new model of neonatal intensive care and to deliver continuity of carer, which is highlighted as a programme for government commitment. I thank all of those who have been involved in helping to achieve the best start vision, and we will publish a full programme report later this year. Question number seven, Megan Gallagher. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what impact reductions to mental health budgets will have on child and adult mental health services. Minister Marie Todd. Following the UK Chancellor's July statement, the Scottish Government continues to face the most challenging financial situation since devolution. We have sought to protect mental health funding despite difficult decisions about reductions which affect all of government. Whilst any reduction is regrettable, we remain committed to taking forward our work across mental health and working closely with key partners. Our collective focus has to be on making as much difference as possible with our funding. We will continue to pursue the commitment to address waiting times backlogs through our direct engagement with NHS boards and drive forward the delivery of our mental health and wellbeing strategy and associated delivery plan, investing in prevention and early intervention as well as in services. Megan Gallagher. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I think regrettable is one word, but disgraceful is another, because in some areas of this country, 60 per cent of children and young people are not being seen between the 19 and 35 weeks of referrals to CAMS. So can I ask the Minister how she intends to tackle CAMS waiting lists when the services have been disproportionately cut by 18.8 million? And can I ask the Minister, does she feel that these cuts are proportionate? Minister. So, to be clear, the CAM service has not been 
um, cut by 18.2 million. The reduction that's been uh, achieved in mental health portfolios, largely through programmes being adapted or taking back money in where programmes have come to an end. In some cases, work's been reprofiled where, it's been where that's been possible. In terms of CAMS, actually, we have a really good news story to tell, and I'm very, very proud of the progress and sustained progress that we have made over the last few years. That's been down to enormous effort from staff all over Scotland. But what we have seen in the first half of this year has been the net best national performance against CAMS waiting times since the 18-week standard was introduced 10 years ago in 2014. In the quarter up to June 24, we saw 84.1% of CAMS patients starting treatment within 18 weeks of referral, up from 73.8% in the same quarter in the previous year. Eight out of 14 of our territorial boards met the 90% standard, and that's for the second quarter in a row. And one in two children and young people who are referred to CAMS now start treatment within thank six you. weeks. Thank you, Minister. We need to go to the supplementary. Colette Stevenson. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Um, can the Minister advise of the Scottish Government's progress towards meeting the Child and Adolescent Mental Health Services waiting time standard nationally? Minister. So, as I made clear in my previous answer, I am really proud of the progress that we have made. Eight out of the 14 boards met the 90 per cent standard for the second quarter in a row. That is a substantial improvement on where we have been in the past. One in two children and young people referred to CAMS now start treatment within six weeks, and that compares to 12 weeks pre-pandemic. So we have seen a real and sustained improvement during the last few years, which was not apparent prior to the pandemic. We are not complacent, though, despite the progress, and we continue to be absolutely clear that long waits are unacceptable. Performance varies across health boards, and there is enhanced support available from, from government to those individual health boards that are not on track to meet the standard. A supplementary possibly. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. The Minister says that she has been trying to protect mental health funding, but I am afraid that has not been a good track record. The health budget for mental health has been frozen and cut in year for the last two years, with almost £20 million in cuts announced just last week. So the programme for government did say that it was going to commit to £120 million for mental health funding. Can the Minister clarify if that is going to be new money, or is it just a repackage of existing funding? Minister. So the £120 million commitment was apparent from the budget, which we as a parliament collectively passed earlier this year. The savings, as I have been clear, have been largely but not solely made by reprofiling spend. So we will slow down the pace of our delivery on commitments by removing some funding from marketing and by um, pulling together the funding for, um, for example, in the Mental Health Enhanced Outcomes Framework. It brings together a number of previous mental health funding streams. We now offer a single flexible funding stream to uh, NHS boards and IJBs, which means that they can use it significantly more flexibly. It's no longer ring-fenced, and we've taken a saving back from that. I think it will work better. And question number eight, Edward Banton. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide any additional funding to NHS Highland in light of the reported overspend in excess of £50 million by the NHS Board in its 2023-24 revenue budget. Cabinet Thank you, President Officer. We provided increased investment of half a billion pounds for NHS boards in 2024-25, uh, taking funding to over £14.2 billion, pounds, an increase of almost 3% in real terms, with NHS Highlands seeing £39 million pounds of increased investment for 2024-25. Uh, notwithstanding this investment, NHS boards, like other public services, are under unprecedented pressure as a result of spiralling UK inflation, which has eroded our spending power, Brexit and COVID, uh, and we are continuing to work with them to address the financial challenges this year and beyond. Uh, the Scottish Government recognises the continued financial and operational pressures uh, facing health and social care uh, and the need to recover, reform and improve services. Edward Banton. Um, 
And I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. In short, I think that means no. So, as there won't be any additional funding, and there's no way for NHS Highland to save additional funds by reducing their biggest cost, which is staff costs, can the Cabinet Secretary reveal which elective surgery the gov uh, surgeries the Government suggests that NHS Highland should cancel to allow them to remain financially solvent? Cabinet Secretary. So we are working uh, through uh, our uh, finance uh, directorate to support uh, NHS boards working through financial pressures that they're facing and, and work to uh, their financial recovery plans, including that of NHS Highland. And I've had a, a good working relationship with the new Chief Executive Fiona Davis on uh, meeting uh, to those uh, financial plans. We'll continue to do so uh, to ensure that we protect uh, frontline uh, NHS provision uh, rather than, as Edward Mountain suggests, that we see it stripped back. And I have two requests for supplementaries. I intend to take both, but I would seek cooperation in that they are both brief. First, Fergus Ewing. Uh, Sonia Russell, GPs in the Highlands assure me that £6 million can be saved every year in the Highlands if NHS Highlands return to GPs the service of providing vaccinations. That makes 100 million savings in Scotland. I've been pressing this for two and a half years. Why won't the Cabinet Secretary order NH Highland to make these savings? Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, thank you, President Officer, and I, I thank Fergus Ewan for his question, on which we uh, have engaged uh, previously, uh, as well as with local GPs uh, in uh, his uh, constituency on this very point. Uh, he'll be aware that the 2018 GP contract was agreed between the Scottish Government and the BMA following a poll of the profession. The transfer of vaccinations was a key element of that contract and allows GPs to focus uh, on what only they can do. It does not mean, however, that GPs should never deliver vaccinations. The contract provides flexibility in rural uh, situations, and I have asked NHS Highland uh, and to make full use of all these flexibilities within the GP contract to ensure comprehensive delivery of our vaccination programmes. And I understand that the latest NHS Highland vaccination de data demonstrates improved rates. A supplementary emerald. Thank you, President Officer. It was good to hear the Cabinet Secretary lay out the increase in funding that the NHS Highland received from the Scottish Government this financial year and that the Government is willing to support it with further financial challenges. Uh, could he advise what level of cut would have been delivered to the Health Board if we had followed the real terms cut to health resource spending laid out by the UK Government? Yeah, thank you, President. So I thank Emma Roddick for this uh, question. In 2024-25, NHS Highlands resource budget increased by 3.7 percent in real terms compared to last year. In cash terms, NHS Highlands budget increased by £39 million, 5.1 per cent in the same period. Had the Scottish Government followed the previous UK Government spending for the Department of Health and Social Care, NHS Highland would have seen a real terms cut of 0.2 per cent. So that highlights the importance of the responsibility this Government has taken to increase the resources available to us, opposed by both now Labour and the Tories, uh, through more progressive taxation. Had we followed uh, their advice, our health boards, including Highland, it would have been in a much worse perspective. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes uh, portfolio questions on NHS recovery, health and social care. There will be a very short pause before we move on to the next item of business to allow front bench teams to change position. Thank you.